So hello, everyone. Welcome. I'm super happy that you're joining me. Um, I'd love to share what I know, what I've learned. Uh, so welcome. We're going to talk about creating an urban permaculture garden. And the best way that I can do that, I think, since I don't know you and what your needs are, where you live, and what your situation is like, is to walk you through how I created ours and uh, talk about permaculture. Hang on just one sec. What have I done here? There we go. Okay. Um, so permaculture is, it's pretty complicated. You mentioned permaculture, and unless you know about it, you know, people's eyes glaze over and they go, what the heck is that? And you say urban farming and they go, oh no. Uh, so um, I want to talk about urban permaculture, which doesn't officially exist, really. Um, we're kind of bunch of us who are interested in it are creating this genre of, of kind of urban farming. Um, but we all should understand what permaculture is. Um, it was conceived by two academics, an environmental psychologist and environmental something, maybe two environmental psychologists, uh, early, late 70s, early 80s in uh, Tasmania. And they were super academic, super smart, lots of crazy fancy words and a kind of unyielding principles, which isn't bad. It just doesn't work for me. Um, and they came up with three kind of overarching um, ethics, which were people care, earth care, um, fair share, which I totally agree with. And then a half dozen permaculture principles, which are listed down on the right. And we can, we can talk a little bit about them. Um, but if you take a quick read, um, they probably won't mean a lot to you. And they didn't to me before I, you know, I studied, I went to study. But basically what permaculture is, it's, it's kind of like biomimicry. It is a design system for sustainable living. It's like in your house and out at work and at school and everything, living and land use that really adheres to, to nature's logic. Uh, that's, that's it. Um, that's really what it is we're trying to we're trying to create closed resilient systems that need very little intervention so like a rainforest you know a temperate rainforest tropical rainforest or river system they exist and they exist in their within their own system they don't need us to help them they certainly don't need us to harm them but what we're trying to do is create those systems at home so that we have a very low environmental footprint uh, this little guy, this little squirrel, his name is Spot. He lives here with us. He's three. He's a baby here. Uh, you'll see him later. Okay, so um, urban permaculture is what I want to talk about. I love it because I, you know, because it's bendy. Um, I think it's a way forward for the masses, a way forward for everyone. It embraces the ethos and ethics that you saw listed earlier offers something for everyone. And that means if you live in an apartment, in a tent, in an RV, you know, on a on the beach, in a high rise, you know, you just have a balcony, you don't have any outdoor space at all, everyone can participate and encourages interpretation and imagination. And it is as much of an art and intuition as uh, it is grounded in science and structure, which is my favorite part. And it is based on resilience. So being resilient um, and building resilient systems. And I always say, do your best, imagine and implement as many of the permaculture, the, the rural permaculture principles as you can. And as you are allowed to in cities, we have rules and it's to create a beautiful, righteous and sustainable life for yourself. So we're gonna start here on the left, rural permaculture. On the right, this is an aerial view drone picture of our property that my daughter took in August of last summer. Uh, just very quickly, the, the front yard is on the right. It looks like it's the railway track around this actually a trellis. That is new. That up until last summer, that did not exist. It was just bare, you know, beetle ravaged soccer lawn, raising three kids. We did nothing there. It was just bare grass surrounded by a really old 72-year-old uh, hedge, 72-year-old uh, house in a 72-year-old neighborhood of low-rise ranchers surrounded by trees and trees and trees and beautiful gardens, very wild, on the edge of the mountains in West Vancouver, about 500 feet above sea level. 
So that's our little homestead, our home site. On the left, you see a typical permaculture kind of zone plan based on the ideals that we learn as permaculture designers. Ideally, you will buy a property or inherit a property. You'll have a property of some size in a rural environment, untouched. And the idea is you use the design principles you learn and the natural systems you learn about to design your homestead. So you'll walk this property hundreds of times, 12 to 18 months, and you'll observe hydrology, wind, sun, water, um, when it, what the temperature is like at different times of the year, where the water pools, where the wildlife cut through, where the privacy issues are, where the, where the what kind of disease exists in plants and trees and forest, um, where the birds migrate, all of this, you'll observe it and then you will start planning your home in zone at ground zero in the perfect spot facing south um, in the best part of the property. And then you'll design everything else you need for your life your completely self-sustaining life, sustain, sustainable, self-sustaining and sustainable life in these five, five or six concentric circles moving out from the center, where, which is you. And far away in zone five, you have your unmanaged wilderness, which is your crazy wild forest or wherever, where nobody lives, just wildlife are. And then you'll have you know, in from there, you'll have your your foraging for nuts and berries and your summer pasture for your cows. In zone three, you'll have like sheep and small crops and maybe your nut trees and maybe your wheat fields. In zone two, closer in, you've got your berries and your chicken coop and your market garden and your maybe your greenhouse. And then zone one, you've got your kitchen garden, your herb garden, your 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 rose garden. And then, of course, there's you, that you're inside the house. So if we were to have moved into this bare land as a bare, as a bare land, we would have put our house where it is, and then we would have zone, designed out in these beautiful, nice, sensible circles, and everything would be perfect, and we wouldn't have to walk far to get to the market garden, and we would have, like, you know, the chicken coop would be right outside, and everything would be perfect. But this is the city so this is what we ended up with a very messy um but lovely um non-concentric overlapping uh, circles and straight lines um and we put things where we could um uh, where they where we were allowed to because when we moved into this home 21 years ago um it had been renovated there's you know, there are sewer lines, there's sidewalks, there's paving, there's rules, there's neighbors, there's fences, there's bylaws, there's all kinds of things. And this is what you get. And that's totally fine. Um, we still can get what we want. We haven't quite finished yet. Um, but this mess, this beautiful mess is what you get in urban permaculture. And so I say, don't sweat it, just kind of reinvent permaculture. And I have come up with a solution, which is called just do your best. And five things, uh, learn about permaculture and do your best following the ethics and principles. Mimic nature and garden organically. Design intuitively. You know, you can't put it in one. If it's got to go in five, no problem. If it's not a circle, it's a square. That's okay too. Um, and create and respect habitat, meaning in your garden and also wherever you live. We have to worry about bears and cougars and all kinds of things wildlife and salmon streams. So we're, we're, we have a lot to work to think about and everybody's situation is different. And finally, waste nothing and share everything. And in order to accomplish these things, I've come up with just five principles, not 12, five. And this is my short list. One, mimic nature. Two, conserve and store resources. That would be water, solar, nutrients, all every step along the way. Sorry, I skipped and mimic nature. That means always use organic everything. Um, if you're creating a garden, how would nature create that garden? What would it look like architecturally, structurally, biologically? Um, and if I'm building something, I'm gonna try and mimic a natural shape or the, the elevations in nature. Okay, we talked about two and three, uh, create habitat and biodiversity. That is in my soil, that is all the plantings that I do. And that is um, respecting pollinators and wild creatures. Four, this is the most important thing. I'd put it at one, except nature's more important. 
no dig. Do not dig your beds raised or otherwise. And I'll tell you why later. And five is repa harvest, of course, uh, food for medicine, and then waste nothing from that harvest to the best of your abilities. And then over on the left, I've kind of reorganized my three ethics because I believe every decision I make, I am first going to defer to nature and to the environment because we're in such a mess. Like I'm not going to choose the environment over my children, obviously, but um, if I have to compromise and not get everything I want because I'm making the best environmental choice, that's what I'm going to do 100% of the time. Okay, so now that we have gone over all of this, and you can go back, you can email me, I can send you these slides, whatever you need, go to the library YouTube channel and look at it again. It's a lot to learn. But now that we are thinking about these five kind of overarching principles, and we're going to divide, the, we're going to design our space, if it's a balcony, a yard, whatever it is, we're going to go to, go to Google Earth, we're going to take a screenshot of our of where we live, and we're going to map out what we want to put where. And then we're going to go outside and we're going to start putting bits into place. I'm going to, the next slide is going to show you our yard almost one year ago, March 24th. My daughter and I went out to the front, lockdown had just begun, and we started walking off and marking out our urban front yards. It looked terrible. It was really brown and bare. There was McMansions going up all around us. The trees had come down. It wasn't pretty. And this is how it looked. We had a blank slate. Lots of potential, but lots of work to do. We lost a lot of trees. We, um, why that light came on anyway. The lot was quite level, sloping slightly south to west. We had good sun exposure all day long. Um, we had chafer beetle damage all over the place, but the soil biology was really good because, you know, I, we never used any chemical fertilizers or even moss killer, nothing. So you dig down and there's lots of worms, really great biology. We had good drainage, um, no storm sewers, unfortunately, but a lot of gravel way, way down. And so, you know, um, that's where the water goes and we're in a rainforest. There's a lot of water. Um, we had mature conifers behind me where I'm standing to take this photo. Um, spruce, maple, we had mis nice wisteria standard, really old, very, very deep hedges of boxwood and laurel, some 10 feet deep. And while I would never recommend planting them now because they're water pigs and they're really not, they are not righteous plantings, they don't really give you anything. Um, ours are just packed with with wildlife, lots of birds and small creatures live in them because they're so old and so thick. So I would never take them down. And then we had good paving. We had pavers with spaces between them, which allowed the water to go through, which was great. A small but old greenhouse, old small greenhouse and in-ground irrigation. And you can see in the inset, my plan, my aerial plan, it shows where the sun comes, where the wind's coming, where the water comes from, and where I wanna put the raised beds and all the different pieces. So, we took that plan, we started marking things off the string, building beds, and just five months later, this is what it looked like, standing in the same spot. It was amazing. And that happens because we used permaculture principles. We were, we, we, it's like, I know I sound like a crazy woman, but I promise you, it is like nuclear gardening. If you just use biological elements, organics, look, listen to nature, follow nature, garden intuitively, it can happen. And uh, it happened here. It's crazy what, what, can, what can happen. So we have this beautiful little lush, beginning, the beginnings of an urban farm. We had nine raised beds. We had a, a small mini orchard with uh, fruit and nut trees. We had a vertical structure mimicking nature 150 foot long trellis which was the beginning of a food forest slash windbreak slash privacy screen uh, we had uh, implemented biological pest controls companion planted uh, we had installed in-ground worm composting and started replacing some less productive ornamentals with native plantings a lot of pollinator habitat um, bee habitat 
water uh, and thermal controls. And uh, we had planned for 12 month food production, which is, is working, still working. And we had isolated sites for mushroom gardens, sod covered um, root cellar and a keyhole garden. And those are on the agenda for this year, those three things. Some more views. See, starting on the left with this little, it's really quite beautiful and tropical looking out there, just based, just using perennial vegetables like kale, which are quite beautiful. Um, there's a, we have a nice sitting area. The trellis is planted with um, either pollinator plants or hops for making beer or grapes for making wine or um, figs, different things. Uh, the raised beds have vegetables. We have a berry patch, a small berry patch in the bottom uh, middle there you can see, which is actually crazy prolific and a nice sitting area. So, you know, that this whole space, which was completely useless after the kids got big, um, was is now a productive little farm. Okay, no dig beds. Um, these beds, these are very inexpensive, just one by eight cedar with um, agricultural hinges, um, stacking beds that I meant, I really wanted stone beds and maybe one day I'll get those, but it's not in the budget. And uh, for now, so these are beautiful. I love them. I think they're really cool. cool. Um, they are four by eight by 20 inches deep. They're um, at the very bottom. There's uh, turned over, there's composted sod blocks on the very bottom, upended, which I used from another project on the boulevard. I just composted the sod blocks and then I used them for the bottom of these beds. Then I put cardboard over that and 18 inches of organic compost, which you can, sorry, you can either make, I mean, I can't make comp compost out in the open because of bears, uh, but you can get it in, in cities. Uh, well, you can buy it from cities uh, or, you know, farmers. Uh, the wood was treated organically so that it's, it's basically just, um, it's basically been petrified uh, to preserve it. Um, no dig is, is a great solution because I don't get weeds. I'll explain about that. And it's very, very rich and, and um, it's great soil biology. It's living soil. I stack the beds west to each, east, which is just good practice. And I, you know, they, they stack vertically. Um, sorry, vertically. Yes. Um, north to south and here's a closer look at the, the raised beds there's a variety there's the ones in the front yard the ones we just looked at there's a old raised bed if you look in the bottom middle it's an old iron bed that's about 20 years old i just replaced the sides on it recently and when i did so the structure of the soil was so great even though it was really moist i just took off the sides Soil stayed intact and replaced the sides. There's some on the bottom left, tomato potatoes, which are crazy last year. And the top center image might seem a bit weird to people, but that is like one of my favorite images because it just really speaks to how good the soil is. Mushrooms in your vegetable beds are like a good sign. It just speaks to the, the, um, the life that's going on beneath the bed. And that's, I think that's just fennel and beans and uh, mushrooms, millions of little mushrooms. I've got raised beds in the back, used uh, animal feed troughs on casters. They really are, make great, uh, retain the heat really well. I can move them in and out of the sun. But the same principle applies to all of these beds. I, I will pull out a root veg, but everything else just gets cut at the surface. I don't dig them, I don't turn them over. I compost them just from the top just like nature does in a rainforest situation. So I want to spend a little bit of time on this slide just because if you're going to study permaculture at any level, you need to know this and you'll hear some of these words over and over and you'll go, what the hell is that? Uh, anyway, it's pretty simple. Soil is your biggest asset. It is a living, breathing organism and it feeds the planet. And it has been just killed by industrial agriculture, by chemical fertilizer, it kills all of the soil biology. It, and then all the fertilizer, because there's no structure, the fertilizer just leaches out and pollutes the oceans and it's on and on and on. But what we can do as permaculturists, permaculturists is uh, feed our soil. And this is what soil should look like. It, it ultimately is made up of the same things we're made up of, which is you know pretty much half minerals, 20, 30% water and air, 
and then 10 percent well our ratios are different this is soil and 10 10 or 15 percent organics and in the organics it's like things that are living are dead or are decaying plant manager plant matter and animals microbes insects uh, fungi um this particular picture is actually taken in a glass planter by the Aberdeen Mycorrhizae Institute. And it shows a tiny little pine seedling. That's just a wee little seedling. And its roots are not very big. They just are inside those little white uh, ovals that are, they look like amoeba. Everything else you see there is, my, is mycelium. It's the mycorrhizal network made up of fungi, just millions of miles of threads that attach a, to and around plant roots. And they act as like super highways for nutrition, for water, for medicine, for communication to and within different plants in this soil structure. They also, they also create, they aerate the soil and um, kind of and hold it together. So how this all works is, the sun powers this whole thing. Photosynthesis, and the plants photosynthesize by using sun, water, carbon dioxide, from carbon dioxide out of the air. They pull the carbon dioxide down into the soil and they create um, the sugar and in, a, in a, a couple of different ways. They, they create chains of glucose, which turn into the structure of the plant. So they're building themselves. They're building themselves out of chains of glucose. And they send sugar and protein and carbon down into the soil and it leaches out the roots, kind of like root sweat. It's called exudite. You'll hear that word. I can, and, and, and that exudite is, smells really good to beneficial fungi and insects, microbio, microorganisms that that particular plant, in this case, the little um, pine, needs to keep it healthy. It's like pheromones. It's like, come on, come live with me. And my little, my little microbiome. My microbiome is my family that lives with, lives in my rhizosphere, in my root neighborhood, and it's all connected. You know, we get our internet, our light, our water, sewer. Everything is supplied by the mycorrhizal network. And so now that you know this, and you see this is all going on invisibly under the soil, under everything, under corn, under, under blade of grass, under everything that lives in the soil, you can see why you should not dig because you're going to crush the freeways. You're going to crush the internet. You're going to kill all these little critters and cut them off from each other because they're just living there happily eating each other, creating uh, fertilizer, sinking carbon into the soil, into the soil and creating this rich humus, black carbon rich soil. And they're doing it by way of this amazing network, which just starts with the little spores of the mushrooms you see up top there. They go down, they fly off into the into the atmosphere and they get into the water stream and they find their way into the soil and they develop this amazing network. And you don't see any of it. Anyway, that is at the heart of everything you'll do in permaculture, no matter where you are. Okay. So here we have um, all of our beds have worm, com worm compost in them. And you can see an example of one in this right bottom corner. It's just a black plastic bucket. It's not glamorous, but it's functional. It has a lid and a whole bunch of holes drilled, quarter inch holes drilled all over the place, the bottom and the sides, but not in the part of the bucket that sticks up above the soil because you want to be able to seal it and seal in the smell so you don't attract any wildlife. We'd have bears all over the place if I didn't have these. Um, so I keep my kit, I put kitchen waste in there. I keep the beds clean so that slugs and stuff don't come along. It's very convenient. Every bed has one and millions and millions of worms come in and out of those holes and they're having a great time on their little worm smorgasbord inside and then they go out and visit their friends and they poop everywhere and that's amazing fertilizer. Um, one thing to remember is not to, well, they say, although my guys seem to like garlic and onion, apparently worms and compost don't like them. Mine do, but that's something to think about. And so for every scoop of green, you put in a couple of handfuls of brown. That could be cardboard, which has carbon in it, brown leaves that have carbon in it. That's the thing you want your carbon load and you want your green. 
And you just put a little bit of water in there to keep the ants out and you keep the lid on. And what happens is the ants and the insects take the compost down and out into the garden through the hole. So you don't really have to empty them. They just look after themselves unless you overload them. This is how they look inside. That's a little cute little um, red wiggler worm on the left and there's a whole pile of them there in the middle. Um, and you can see how I, how I manage it. I just put the trimmings in. I put a little bit of the dirty water from washing vegetables in. And then I use the rest of that dirty water to water pots elsewhere. You don't want to drown the worms. Okay, herb spiral. Um, this is a fantastic and favorite permaculture installation, which is really, you can see by, well, what it is, it's a spiral. It is about seven feet wide, four feet high. Um, it's dirt right down to the bottom. There's no like floors. Um, and by planting different kinds of herbs, and sometimes green vegetables in different locations at different elevations, different sun exposures, different damp exposures, different wind exposures. You are you are planting herbs from all, all around the world in this one little spot. It's contiguous, it's, it's super cool, it's really fun. You can have Mediterranean dry, hot, loving herbs at the top and the, and the south. And in the back, you could have things like you can see here on the bottom right, on the far right, that's Labrador tea. That's a bog herb, herb. And I've got a little watercress pond. You can see in the top middle shot. And uh, that likes, you know, they usually like riverbeds or creek beds. And this thing looks after itself. You know, it rains or the sprinkle goes off and the water just percolates down and comes out between the stones and falls out into the herb little bog at the bottom and it's super happy. And that actually was conceived by Bill Mollison, one of the founders of permaculture. He did this, he came up with this idea and it's, it's absolutely brilliant. Mine is about really far, actually it's in our front yard, far from the kitchen, ideally 10 feet from your back door. We can't do that because we have a patio there and that's what happens in the city. You, you do these things where you can. Uh, it could be much smaller, it could be much, could be much bigger, it doesn't have to be so high, you can do whatever you like. But you can see on the left there, due north is the mountains, and on the far side of this uh, herb spiral, that's where the bog is. It's kind of cold and shady there. And on this side where the sun is setting, the lavender is still happy. Okay, we uh, you might want to think about putting in a little um, mini orchard. You could do this in a pot. You could put one tree. You could have a big pot and put a couple of trees. You could have a raised long planter, put three side by side. You can do, you know, these little mini orchard, mini uh, fruit trees, dwarf fruit trees are amazing. And how it works is you have dwarf, dwarf root stock. And that ends about a foot above the soil line you can see in some of these photos. And then there's regular tree grafted onto that rootstock and the root tells the tree not to get too big, but the top of the tree says, I won't, but I'm still gonna make full-size fruit. So these fruit trees get packed with full-size fruit. It's kind of weird in a way, but it's also lovely. And thus uh, so you can grow a lot in a small space. Um, you, they will get up, some of them will get up to 10, 12 feet high. I would never let that happen. I prune mine, keep it about seven feet because I can reach seven feet sometimes. I can, I can prune these. I can harvest them. I can look after any kind of bugs they get. Um, and the trick to this, it's really simple. Um, it works well planted in threes, a triangle like I have. You can plant them side by side too. But the key is keep the space between them or inside the column, free, uh, prune free, just like you would in a fruit tree, so that air and sun, everything can move freely through there and it won't get uh, diseased and stay wet. Um, also a good idea is to underplant them with beneficial plants that are pollinator friendly or attract predator insects to eat, like say lacewings that might come and eat the aphids that apple, apples might get or um, ladybugs things like that. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about underplantings because I get a lot of questions about them. But it is, we have 18 dwarf fruit trees. We've got um, columnar and standard apples. We have pears, we have plums, we have cherries, we have an almond and a crab apple, which helps in the cross-pollination. 
Um, it's really fun. And these are beautiful in pot and patio pots. In fact, you can get, you can have a three foot high dwarf apple bush. It just depends on how you trim it. So here you see in the top left, it's early on in the season. They're just coming to flower and uh, the chive has just started to explode. Um, I put barrage in the middle typically and chamomile uh, also as pots of my, on my underplantings. Um, you can see on the right, you know, the, the columnar apple gets pretty uh, quite a lot of fruit on it. And in the backyard, I just wanted to throw this in here. I have an espalier apple tree in a feed trough on casters that I can move in and out of the sun and uh, has three different species of apple on it. And I now it has become like my bait fruit tree. So, you know, at the end of last summer, I had one apple left, which I was very grateful for. And I was very happy to share the rest with the squirrels and the raccoons and anybody else that wanted to come and eat away. And they didn't bother my front yard fruit at all. Got a persimmon, a, a Fuyu persimmon. Uh, that's it in the uh, top there. That was actually taken in December. Fuyu's, um, or many persimmon mature very late. No, the, uh, the, the tree on the left there, that's, it's actually in a pot. It's shown there on the left. But by the time the fruit ripens, it's like many hard frosts have come and gone and there isn't a leaf left on the tree, but the fruit are still there. It's amazing. Um, there's a grafted plum top right there. That is dwarf root stock with five different varieties of plum uh, grafted onto it. It's really fun to have, you know, different red, green, yellow plums growing in one fruit tree. And they're not big. You can see on the bottom middle uh, uh, slide, uh, on the left, it's the plum. Middle is the, um, what do you call that, almond. And then there's three columnar cherries on the right. And I get a lot of fruit. Well, the, the birds and us get a lot of fruit. So I want to talk about underplanting. Uh, you have a lot of choices. And there, this is where you can really have a huge impact as a permaculture designer or permaculturist in an urban environment is you can create and like using that fruit, those little, say the a dwarf fruit, fruit tree, as an example, you can create a whole biodiverse uh, little ecosystem um, around that tree uh, by planting a, say a, a vine up the tree, using the tree as a vining trellis, put a tap rooted a horseradish down, um, to grow horse, horseradish for you and also aerate the soil because of the deep tap roots and plant chives or herbs that have shallow fibrous roots around it. And they will hold, help hold water into the system and provide shade, a living mulch for the plants. Um, some um, plants like uh, comfrey, which you see in the middle here, you'll hear a lot about comfrey being like the darling of permaculture. Everybody loves to plant comfrey. I find it a bit big for an urban setting, but um, in, a, in a rural setting, it, it's wonderful. Um, the idea here is that you just, you can just, it's called chop and drop. You just chop off the leaves, leave them there to compost naturally, and then it just grows back really quickly. Um, I find that a bit of slug bait, actually. I don't do that, but it, it, it in the city it matters, in the country it wouldn't necessarily matter. Um, so when you have underplantings, Think about the opportunities, I should say. Think about all the different things you can do. You can create food for yourself. You can plant radishes, you can plant celery, and you can plant horseradish. And those are, are plants that grow down with deep tap roots and aerate the soil. And they can be, they could be perennials uh, like horseradish. Um, they can, you know, if you can do native plants, great. Uh, pollinary fr pollinator friendly to attract bees and uh, create habitat for tiny wee creatures. Uh, there are all kinds of options. So come back to the slide when, you're, when you come to it. Uh, you might want to plant a tiny berry patch. This was meant to be a kind of holding area for berry bushes, but it ended up being like they just set fruit like right away. I think because we had put a uh, pollinator um, friendly uh, sweet alyssum on the bottom on the ground as a, as a living mulch. And um, we just had fruit set like it was crazy, so we couldn't move them, but we will move them this fall, I think. Uh, we have blueberries, uh, jostaberries, uh, three colors of currants, three colors of uh, gooseberries. And uh, we just have to, they look after themselves. One thing I didn't mention, I should have mentioned um, when we're talking about the apples, the fruit trees, and 
it applies here equally, is we always have to pick the fruit just before it ripens because bears, raccoons, other creatures won't bother the fruit unless they're starving, of course, um, until they know it, they know when it's ripe, they can smell it a mile away and they'll come and decimate your garden. But if you pick it just before it ripens, which we do, um, you won't have any issues. And I'm gonna skip to here to show this little cedar bowl, this little yellow cedar bowl at the very bottom. Um, I don't know what it is about yellow cedar, but it does ripen fruit beautifully. So we just keep the semi-green fruit and tomatoes in this little cedar bowl. And the next day they are magically ripe. I don't know how that works. So um, back to this little berry patch here. You can see the uh, mini fruit orchard in the back. I think this photo was taken in June after the first flush of chai blossoms turned, went to seed. I left them for a bit for the birds. And then I took the seed to use in cooking. It's, um, well, it's like black onion seed. It's delicious. You can um, grind it up. So um, yeah, I just chop it back and then it just grows again. I had three harvests of chives last, last year. Um, so you can see the blueberries, beautiful, a lot of fruit. You can do this in a pot, you know, you, you can do it in a, you know, in a window box or dwarf blueberries. You just have to make sure that the soil is suitable, maybe put some pine needles or something in it to acidify it. Um, okay, you might consider putting up some bee houses and you can do this on a patio. You can do it on the side of your house. You can do it whether or not you have a garden. You could just have a pot of lavender and uh, put up a bee house and either attract or buy. Five minute warning. Oh my God, I'm talking too much. Anyway, okay. So um, these are native bees. They um, don't make honey or they just lay eggs in these little bee houses. You can see in the top right, there's some bee houses that we have. You have to provide them with a little bit of water, a little bit of dirt, and they will just lay eggs in those little tubes, seal them up with mud, and they'll and, uh, provide some early blooming heather or um, other blossoms. We have some cornelian cherries there for them to eat, and they will pollinate at 80 times the rate of other bees. So these they're also endangered. This is why we... We have them and you might be having some too. There's other pollinator friendly plants we have for the bees. We're converting our lawn to pollinator turf slowly. It's, it's a, a time consuming thing to do, labor intensive, but worth it. Um, it's, it uses up to 75% less water and up to 75% less mowing. You can see there on the left, the pollinator turf is on the top of the dead grass and that dead grass at the bottom is chafer beetle grass. Ground covers, we're using a lot of native ground covers and moss. They really are easy. Uh, I love moss. Some people don't love moss. It really mulches really well. Uh, you might consider not fighting the losing battle and just letting the moss take over because it really is beautiful. This is a uh, native huckleberry that is an option. It's a food source for you and for pollinators. It's also beautiful, it looks like boxwood. And uh, if I were to do it all over again, I would, well, the boxwood was here, but if you're gonna plant a hedge, consider uh, a native evergreen huckleberry, or, yeah, huckleberry. It's like a little blueberry. It's wild roses, some evergreen huckles, or sorry, native honeysuckle at the top there. Um, beautiful uh, high bush cranberry at the bottom, and uh, that is uh, goat's native goat's beard and mosses there on the left. Um, here's some ladybugs that I mail ordered to control my aphids last summer at a little tiny bit of an aphid outbreak in the fruit trees, and these little puppies and they short work munch away at all the aphids, and they're very happy. I built them a little habitat. You can see it there on the right, bottom right. It's kind of weird looking. I just Googled ladybug habitat, built one and they seem happy. Um, they hung around all summer. Um, other things you can do to control pests is copper mesh um, keeps, you can see in the bottom there, keeps slugs out of garden beds. Um, it like somehow electrocutes slugs because they're slime. They don't like it, they shock, they take off. Nasturtiums are like bait for aphids. And um, I've got them planted there under the persimmon. And then in the tomatoes, I have, um, I just put lavender clippings under the tomatoes and basil and it keeps the insects away. 
And speaking of tomatoes, here's some tomatoes that we have under an open kind of um, patio in the back. It's a glass roof. And it, uh, because it's a stone floor and raised beds that are metal and quite deep, um, if it acts as a heat sink. It, it absorbs, it, it holds um, two to four times the amount of solar energy that bed, like open beds would, and holds that energy and feeds it back as heat um, into the evening and at night. So that this situation here, um, we have, you can see at the bottom middle, that's late November. The plants are dead and the tomatoes are still happy. And I will pull quartz every day off of that um, in that um, uh, out of those 20, I think they're 20 plants and three raised planters. And I'll, I'll have a hundred, um, I'll be able to dry a hundred containers of, of um, tomatoes and I freeze them and use them all through the year. And the heat sink situation applies here on the left with the lavender. Um, and in the stone planter with the lavender, it's both on the herb spiral and the planter. Um, they're holding heat way, you can go by there at two in the morning and put your hand on those in the summer and they're still warm. Here's tomatoes. This is like, this is well, now into December here in the top middle. That's um, ripening tomatoes in a bag using the ethylene off gas, they generate themselves to ripen them quickly and they ripen. That's the last bunch of, cher of cherry tomatoes. Um, uh, it's amazing how that works. Water management is another issue. Um, we could do a much better job of managing our water. We go through a ton of water, 88 gallons a person a day on average, which is ridiculous. Almost all of our roof water is just going down into the sewer. If you have a sewer, we don't. Um, and we're trying to capture water as best we can. Uh, we're using downspouts, rain gardens, um, this is a swale, which we dug all the way around the outside of our property to capture all of the crazy rain, uh, the runoff that we were getting from the new building. They took the trees down, lots of paving, water was just pouring onto our property. And so we now capture it. It runs in these swales, which are like underground trenches, um, down under this berm, a raised berm of lavender, which is bee habitat also, and it feeds gardens that we need it to feed. Um, top left and middle those are both rain gardens that are that are more or less self-sufficient they are water is diverted from downspouts and it feeds the ones that are at the perimeter of the house they actually feed the vines that completely engulf like they circle the house entirely and they shade our house without any air conditioning and their habitat for for lots of nests and uh, uh, honeysuckle feeds um, birds and bees and it's a beautiful thing. Bottom left here, that is a big puddle in our backyard, which is uh, an in, a rain garden in progress, which I'm planting with wild edibles um, for primarily for bees, uh, for birds. And then um, these pictures on the on the right is basically us pouring our vegetable washing water all winter into covered into little vegetable planters and dormant strawberry planters that are outside our back door. Um, I, I always wash vegetables in a bucket or the sink and I pour everything into a planter because the water is so rich in nutrients because it's compost tea, basically. You're washing off the compost and making compost tea. So you, it's like a resource you don't want to waste. This is something, uh, this is a vegetable washing station that was created using scrap la, uh, lumber that was left over from building the trellis in the front. And uh, it's just a, you know, it's a Lee Valley outdoor sink. It didn't cost a lot and some old scrap screen and it's turned into a water reclamation station for washing vegetables and feeds the little um, seedling nursery behind it. And that's the greenhouse right behind it. I'll skip through. Well, I don't know if I should, if I have time to talk about mushrooms, but we are building a up outdoor mushroom um, yard in a shady part of the north part of the garden under the spruce tree. Uh, we can grow um, turkey tail and shiitake and lion's mate mushrooms there. It's perfect biology for it, soil biology, shaded. It's under conifer. Uh, a couple of shots there of some mushrooms we grew, my daughter and I, indoors last year. That was fun. Um, so, you know, slowly, slowly, everybody, you know, you can do this. You can do it anywhere. You just need a teeny tiny um, piece of real estate. It just, the conditions just should be right. 
Um, I'm running out of time here. So I'll just scroll through some pictures of our winter garden. We put a um, cold frame in November, put some hoops up in October. We had a hard frost, October 23rd. Um, very late planted seedlings. I got some things in the ground and this is what it looked like just a couple of weeks ago. We had a big snow. I still had some rapini and and spot my squirrel came to say hi and that on the left there that's calette that's like a, a growing in the, under the hoops there and just today we have tomatoes under lights here in my office and some peas and different things in the greenhouse and this is kind of my second last slide to show you why i'm doing this to feed my family nothing going to waste here you can see i'm even using apple peels to make apple scrap vinegar after I've made apple butter. And I'm using the blossoms from the from pinching back the basil to make basil vinegar. And there's all kinds of things, hundreds of things that I make um, and nothing goes to waste. And these are all my little friends that live in a former, what used to be a soccer field, barren landscape is now rich in biodiversity and all kinds of creatures coming to visit all the time, every day. Well, that's pretty much all I have to say. I have one more. Oh, can I? I had one more slide there. Go ahead. Yep. Oh, there we go. Okay. So if you have any questions, you can email me. You can find me at any of these places. I'm happy to answer questions. You know, I don't know everything, but I know a little bit, and I'm here to share what I know. Wow. It. So great. Um, so there are questions in the chat and, I, and the Q&A, and what I thought, well, I've sort of been trying to curate them a little bit, group them into um, themes. Okay. Okay. Um, so maybe we could start with lawn removal. Okay. Um, now, there was one in the chat, and she's talking, okay, she removed her lawn, mostly weeds that was behind or between our front cedar hedge and the sidewalk by pulling the existing plants and shaking out as much soil as possible. Was this a reasonable approach? I planted fern, salad, flowering red currant and other natives. And then someone else was also asking about lawns and it was, I think it was around turning the top layer. Um, although she might actually just be talking about the soil in, in a bed, turning that top layer for the birds um, to eat the cutworms, et cetera, before planting. Mm -hmm. So actually, I don't think that is a lawn removal question. Sorry about that, but <laughs> I think those are separate questions. Do that when they dig their turf, you know, yeah. take care of it, turn it over, and then yeah, the birds either pull the grubs and worms out for the birds, or the birds will come and find them. But it's a good idea, and yeah, I mean, you, there are lots of ways to remove lawn, not chemically, but if you do it mechanically or by turning it over, or you can just put a some impermeable thing over it that just blocks out light over this like over the winter preferably and that will keep the grass from growing and you can just start you know to throw some compost on there and start planting in it right okay good um so just um on the topic of raised beds mm -hmm. um Okay, so there's a lot, a couple of questions about no dig, right? right. Um, can you use sea soil as your top dress compost? Um, and also, I think someone was curious whether, did you actually build those those raised beds yourself with the cedar? Yes. Or did you purchase those? No, I actually, we built those. Those are, those corners, those metal corners, you can get them from Lee Valley. They're not expensive and they're actually used for those you know, when they have a, or, a orchard, they have those big bins they put apples in yeah. and they stack them on top of each other. Those are the stacked in corners. Oh, so, okay. Yeah. If they're one by eight pieces of wood. You put the, they're hinged, they move so you can kind of bend it however you want and you can stack them however you want. So you can take it apart or you, and you can put it higher or whatever you do. It's very easy to do. And you just right. use one by eight cedar. So when you first set yours up, what did you fill it with? Um, I put upturned sod because I had, I built that um, swale in the front where the lavender was. So I had 500 square feet or more than that. It was a ridiculous amount of square feet of 
sod squares because I had taken it and I had to dig way down. So I just piled those upside down in a big compost pile and the, the year went by and the grass died. And then I, I used those squares upside down at the bottom of the bed. So now the grass is dead and it's really composting full of worms. It was beautiful. Mm -hmm. Then I put cardboard on top of that just to keep any weeds should any you know, pop up from coming up through the compost. And then I put compost. I use just pure organic compost. Um, and you can, you can buy it because, you know, we're in a, a big area, yeah. a big metropolitan area. You can, you can order it by the truckload. Um, some people use something called veggie mix. That's widely available or, you know, just don't use anything with fresh manure in it. It would have to be well composted. Manure. Okay. okay. Yeah. And what about sea soil? That was, Soil is a great product and it's a great top dress. It right. would be expensive to use it exclusively, but it's a great, it's basically forest fines, which are, you know, stuff from the forest. Hopefully it's not a living forest or not raping the forest, but it's forest fines and sea um, biology and kelp, which is amazing fertilizer. Okay. And it's not too rich for seeds. It's because someone seemed to think it might be just best for plants. Yeah. I wouldn't put seeds directly into it. I, I would transplant into it mixed with some um, yeah. yeah. soil. Yeah, it would probably burn seed. It might, I don't know that seeds would burn. Yeah. Okay. So let's just talk a little bit about maintenance. Like when I look at your garden, like I'm just imagining you're doing this <laughs> every day, eight hours a day. It just, it looks like a lot of work. No. How many hours or a week are you putting I tell you that I almost get I get almost no weeds because because I it's compost or, 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 and it's well composted compost so and I'm not digging and introducing sunlight and water into seeds that are way down there weed seeds they just don't grow like you get the odd one a bird will plant a seed or whatever you okay. get the odd I don't weed and I because I let the moss go wherever it wants I don't weed there either and every everything is covered with a ground cover, like a wild thing, a wild violets or ferns or bloody dock or something. I honestly don't weed. And even the weeds that come up through the cracks in the sidewalk, if you, if you read my blog, you'll see most of them aren't actually weeds. They're like hairy vetch, which is, which is um, a vegetable. It's like a salad. Yeah. Most things, and you know, they just, it's not a problem when you, when you get into it, like I'm only a year into this garden and I'm not, it's not making me nuts. I spend time out there because I want to. And of course, there are those days when you have 8,000 carrots that you need to pull up, right? Not really 8,000, but you know, you got to get them in. You got to get them in. Yeah. And yeah. Them. Um, otherwise, the seed get too big. That kind of issue. But no, it's not high maintenance. That The point of permaculture is that it's supposed to be a self-sufficient system, just like a little slice of a rainforest or, yeah, I mean, that's ideal, right? But the more elements you can introduce, the more self-sufficient it will be. Okay, that's very encouraging. Um, so someone was asking about container growing and, and, you know, there are a lot of apartments around the library and a lot of our patrons live in apartments. So I think that's a good question. And so his, 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 she or he, it's anonymous. It says, do you have any ninja permaculture strategies for keeping soil in pots really vibrant and healthy without digging or removing it from the pot? Should one just keep layering nutrients on top? Yes. Yes. Well, if you, yes. The, what happens when you have good soil biology is it will be broken down and eaten. It'll be consumed by the plants. And the fungi, what your community in there is going to break down, it's going to break it down into smaller and smaller bits. So if just imagine your pot is in the forest, what happens? You get compost coming down in the form of leaves and all these like dead things lay on top and they, they decay and they go into the soil. And it's no different with a pot. You can put a very small worm compost by using a milk jug or a yogurt container you can get a small, you can get, I think Home Depot sells, they sell bigger ones. I think they sell smaller ones too now. But you can make your own out of an ice cream bucket or of a small bucket. Mm -hmm. I, I think the thing is, start with living soil. 
like really like even if you take a five gallon bucket down to Pacific soils and ask for veggie mix, you're way better off starting with that. And it will be alive already. And as long as you don't let it dry out and kill all those things that are alive and you can help it not dry out by using compost and some living mulch in there, it will just get better and better. Okay. That's really encouraging. And would you rec like, I always think with pots, you're better with a big, the bigger, the better. Like you don't want partly water. You don't want it drying out, but you want something of a certain size, right? Yeah. Bigger is better, but the material matters too. Like uh, terracotta dries out if it's not sealed. Mm, okay. Like if you can get on Craigslist or you can get something that's stone or cement, you know, they, they hold moisture. Well, they also hold heat really well. Um, you know, one trick to keeping the soil really moist is wool. Wool? Wool. If you can get, um, ideally, in, in rural permaculture, you would use the belly wool, the dirty belly wool of a sheep mm -hmm. that you can't card or sell because it's covered in poop. Yeah. Put it, you shred, you, you know, tear it up and mix it in with your soil. It, it sends nitrogen into the soil for years and it holds moisture. But you can do that with recycled wool clothing too. Hmm. It wow. really holds moisture well. And uh, you know, it, it, it's a great idea. It, it's just beautiful to hold. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's so cool. Makes sense. It's a natural product, right? Um, so someone was curious about almonds. You I, Did you mention that you grow nuts? I mean, I know you have fruit, but yeah, almonds actually don't love living in California, which is why they take so much water and the bees are so unhappy. Yeah, they're, they're happy here. Um, and so, yeah, they're, you, they're, they're starting, I think that people thought they, they wouldn't grow here, but you're starting to see them at specialty nurseries and you, you can grow them. They take, they're slow, but it's, um, it's, it's, it's a beautiful tree. And uh, you can Google Lower Mainland, you'll, you'll see almond trees available now. Yeah, and the blossoms are so lovely, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, okay, you, are you still, you'll still up for more questions because there's lots. <laughs> um, okay, question about ivy. Oh. Um, the area has plenty of ivy creeper, creepers, non-poisonous. Um, it's the natural cre creeper in the area. How can I remove them from my garden without chemicals? Well, you know what? Um, I just, it's a never ending battle when it's like, I get some from under the fence, you know, from the neighbor and they're wreaking havoc, but I just cut, I just keep cutting them down at the root. That's the, the best thing you can do. And, and over time you'll win, just pull it out because they'll, they'll kill your trees. They'll take every drop of goodness out of wherever yeah. they are. Yeah. Yeah. What, what about bindweed? Like someone's asking about, I call it bindweed, but morning glory. I mean, I, same. I just pull it out. And you know, yeah. you will, you know, you just got to make a ritual of it. Honestly, that's the, that's the best thing advice I can give is have a cup of coffee, cup of tea, listen to your BBC news on your iPhone and just get out there. And, you know, I do it once a year. I just do it once a season and it keeps, it's fine. I let it get to the point where it really over it's past needing to be done. And then I just do it. If yeah. you do it early, it's never ending. Yeah. So there's, there is some weeding, but I, I think, I oh, think I agree with you. You my, just, that's not my permaculture garden. That's in my garden. That ah, was, okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Sorry. Um, so what about the squirrels? Like um, you've got some in your garden. Are they, do they eat anything you don't want them to? Yes, they do. They eat the, in the back. I, I have bait food for them. And I let them have it. They know, they know they can have it. And uh, I don't know how. I don't. <laughs> they don't bother the front at all. Um, and the thing about permaculture is, you really just kind of have to share. You just got to know. I know that the top, the bottom eighteen inches of my tomatoes will never be mine because everything's going to munch them. And uh, and that's okay. Uh, once I get past that point, then I know it's all mine and, uh, and it, it just works that way. And I'm okay with that. Um, they're really, we, we don't have a choice. I know we, we had, I, there's a, been a, a problem with rodents on the whole North shore this last year. 
mm. and probably this year. And that, that is because people were using rat poison and the raptors were eating the rat, the rat, dead rats. And then their eggs were not viable and the babies couldn't fly and they died. So oh, now no. <laughs> oh they, my God. So there's too many rodents. So that's what happens when you screw around with the kind of yeah. circle, the yeah. web. And so now the good news is the raptors that are around have more to eat and hopefully they'll become healthier. But it's like, it's, you just have to live in the world that is here with the squirrels and the bears and everything you don't like as well and try and figure out a way to you know keep them away from where you don't want them to be and make sure they're fed too i don't you know feed them i mean i don't want to feed a bear or anything but if he's he's happy doing his thing he's not going to bother me yeah yeah um so a couple more questions. One is about uh, mushroom manure. Someone has just bought some and they want to add it to the raised bed. So they're just kind of wondering, do they just add it on top? Um, the raised bed right now is covered with leaf mulch. Um, mm -hmm. What's the best way to do that? I would mix it. Um, I don't put any kind of manure directly. I always mix it like a cocktail. I would mix it up with the leaves and some compost or veggie mix and the manure and just mix it up and try and recreate the soil biology and then put it on mm -hmm. because it can burn. I mean, all manure, no matter what it is, can just overload, can overload with yeah. nitrogen. I mean, I've had a situation with my Espelier fruit tree. I didn't, um, I didn't uh, dilute it enough. And that year I had just leaves and no fruit. Too much nitrogen. Yeah, I've had that problem with manure. Yeah. Yeah, I think it. I don't. I just think it's better to err on the side of caution and always, always mix it up. Yeah. The leaf mold's beautiful. It's just you know how lovely to have that mixed in. Yeah. So um, you mentioned, I think Pacific soil, and someone was asking just um, where where to buy new topsoil. Mm -hmm. Um. There. Um, you can, there are so many different sources and it really depends whether you want a small quantity or a large quantity, but Pacific soil says organic compost. I know that for sure. I know the city does, city of Vancouver does. Um, if you look on Craigslist, there are many sources out in the Valley and, uh, small jobbers who will deliver smaller quantities. Um, you know, you should just ask for references to make sure, but organic is, would be my preference. Yeah. I mean, this whole compost isn't always organic and you don't know that your neighbor's not doing something they shouldn't do, putting it in their cl clippings. So um, you're taking a little bit of a chance um, unless you're buying organic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think we'll stop it there. I did want to ask if you would share with me some of your favorite books um, and then we can put together a list to share with everybody. Hey, I was hoping you were going to ask me that. I put a pile of them here. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah, there's, um, okay, this is the one of the permaculture Bibles. It's um, pre prerequisite uh, reading for the permaculture designer, to become a permaculture designer. It's Principles and Pathways, um, written by David Holmgren. Okay. Uh, it is really hard to read. You got to really be into it. It is a lots of information. Hard to find, it's not been reprinted, but that's the Bible. Um, if you're getting started, I would recommend two books. The Edible Ecosystem Solution, written by Zach Loix, I think. It's a great, easy to understand. Talks about creating little ecosystems. Mm -hmm. Milkwood. And this is co-authored by, I believe, um, David Holmgren. That's a great one. Um, Farming the Woods. This is a really great book. This is written by Ken Mudge and Steve Gabriel. I met both these gentlemen when I went to New York to study uh, outdoor mushroom cultivation. I spent some time at the, both Cornell and at um, Steve Gabriel's farm called, I forget the name of it, but it's it's just a wealth of knowledge. This, this is a really great book too, really easy to understand. 
Mycelium Running is a little bit of an academic book about uh -huh. the whole mycorrhizal network. It's really good, written by Paul Stamets, Stamets who's a brilliant mycologist. And he lives on um, Cortez and in Washington State. This is an amazing book, Grow Your Soil. Ah, oh yeah, okay, I know that one. This yeah. is so great. It's written by a permaculture designer and it's really simple, simple language and just great information about soil biology and how to grow in it and use it. Wonderful. And my last recommendation that I'm reading right now that I just love is called Entangled Life. And it's uh, how fungi makes our worlds makes our world, changes our minds and shapes our futures. But it's not really just about fungi. It's about permaculture. And uh, these are awesome books. I would read all of those books. And um, you know, the other thing, the other way to learn about permaculture, honestly, is reading old, old, old cookbooks. Because <laughs> cookbooks aren't about cooking. They're about living off the land. And uh, right, yeah. Food so that you have enough to feed your family over the winter and what do you do with it and it's you know when you really culinary anthropology is permaculture huh wonderful yeah well what i think i'll do is make a list and uh, hopefully we'll have most of these in our library maybe not some of the more esoteric ones but um i can probably order new things too and i'll, I'll send that out to everybody so that they have that um thank you for sharing that that's fantastic mm -hmm. um and thank you for this i I just love it. I love your the photographs were amazing and all the information you shared. So inspiring. This is great. Thank you Thanks so much. That. And also everybody, the other thing, of course, is the Modern Farmer magazine, which um, I think you can get online. Yeah, at modernfarmer.com. Yeah. It's okay. A lot of information. Like yeah. it really, really is. Great. And and Laura's blog, Upfront and Upfront and beautiful. Upfront and beautiful. Great. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for coming today. Um, really appreciate uh, your participation and all the fantastic questions. Um, yeah. So, our next uh, webinar is April 10th, and it's going to be all about tomatoes. Uh, Jane Sherratt, also a local gardener, is going to be here once again, Saturday, 2 p.m., April 10th, talking about tomatoes. So, we'll see you then. Okay. Bye bye. Thank you. Thanks a lot.